I'm Rosalind Corita, and this is History and Heritage. Today, I am at 1601 Madison Street, and you'll know it because this is the Tanglewood House. Every time you drive by Madison Street, you've seen this. But today, we're gonna talk about the story of one of the cabins that is located here at the Tanglewood House. Tanglewood House is now an event venue, but around back, there's a lot of history. Hello, my name is Kenny York and I'm with Manor Cafe Ministries. Our goal is to feed as many people as much as we can. You can help us with that by just going to our website and, and clicking on Donate Now and become a friend of Manor and see what that's all about. Our phone number is 931-933-0970 and I'll appreciate your help. Thank you so much. Hi, this is The Restore. My name is Catherine Norbeck Daly and I'm the manager here at the Habitat for Humanity Restore. Everything we sell in here is donated. All of the proceeds go to benefit the Habitat for Humanity homes. We take windows, doors, building supplies, cabinets, household goods, and we will pick up. The Restore is located in downtown Clarksville at 408 Madison Street across from Madison Street United Methodist Church. The phone number is 645-4242. Call us to schedule your next donation pickup. I have my friend here today, Carolyn Farrell, and Carolyn has written a number of books about Clarksville and its history. And she really focused me on something that we've never talked about before. Uh, Carolyn calls this the cabin that came to Clarksville, and she's going to tell us the story. And just to orient you, we are at 1601 Madison Street. You drive by it all the time, and it has a big secret. So tell us the story of this cabin. The cabin that you see when you're passing by on Madison Street has the epitome of all the stories you would put together when you talk about the early settlement of the United States. Uh, the story actually begins about 234 years ago on August 1st, 1780, when a man by the name of William Neely and his daughter uh, Mary were on site at Neely's Bend in Nashville, near at Nashville, Tennessee. And it was the events of that day that caused this cabin to be what it is today. The history of the cabin, the people who stayed in the cabin, mm -hmm. people who visited the cabin are all part of the story. So I'll start with the story. Okay. Uh, it is the uh, Revolutionary War is winding down and soldiers are uh, going back to their homes. And one of those soldiers was William Neely. He had a family, a, a wife with 10 children and they decided, like a lot of settlers, to move west because they got a land grant. William Neely got 640 acres from uh, his service in the Revolutionary War, and so he came uh, west, and with him, uh, his family, his slaves, and when they reached the Watauga settlement, they met up with somebody we might know, James Robertson. Okay, very familiar name in, and, in and Tennessee his, history. Yeah. And his daughter, Rachel, and they all decided that they were going to come down the Cumberland River and uh, settle in the Nashville area. Now, when they came down the Cumberland, probably they came on a barge? Well, actually what they did, uh, they dug out uh, canoes. Uh, they say that William Neely's canoe was 56 feet long, okay, three feet wide, and three feet deep. And he put his wife, ten children, and possibly some slaves in the canoes. And then he followed alongside the water route, driving the cattle and the horses. What an amazing, amazing trip. And of course, uh, the do documentation of uh, James Robertson and him coming into the national area is, is history. But uh, these are the kind of people that we and Neely knew from the offset and, and, and uh, would later meet up with them in, later in, in, in time. But we and Neely came down to the uh, to the Nashville area, they arrived at what is now called Fort Nashville. Now I gotta mm -hmm. tell you this, during the time of the 1780s, 1779, that was not known as Fort Nashville. Mm -hmm. They simply called it the Bluff or the French Lick. 
Okay. Never known to the settlers at, as Fort Nashville. Mm -hmm. So they came into the fort there because, again, there's a lot of Indian activity and so forth. And William Neely helps the fort by clearing the land. And he gets paid a good amount of money by James Robertson for doing this. And at the time, he either has brought his tools with him or he purchased them. Uh, William Neely is going to be dead within the year not knowing that this is about to happen. But those tools are going to be very important for building the cabin that we're going to focus on. So uh, they have now been living at Fort Nashville for a couple of weeks and they decide to go further in and say it was called Mansker's Fort and that's in downtown Goodlesville. You can visit the re uh, recreation of this fort there. Casper Man Mansker in uh, 1775 came with John Donald's, uh, John uh, Montgomery in the Montgomery County. You know, all these things, you can see how they're kind of coming together. Being together. So, Casper Mansker was a German immigrant. He came in, he had built a station or a fort similar to our, our uh, Severe Station. Mm -hmm. It was an area that was stockaded. Uh, people lived there uh, until they could feel like they could go out and build their own cabins. And so they stayed with the Manskers for a while. Now, at the time of this, uh, this massacre that we're about to talk about, uh, there was a, a sulfur creek on the land that William Neely was interested in. And not only was it a, a spring, but it had salt. Okay, now this is still in Nashville? or is This, this is in, in Nashville, okay, okay. in what's now called Neely's Bend, because okay. Neely's Bend is, is named for the family. So Mary and uh, her father, William, are planning on boiling the water from the springs to get salt. Salt was necessary not only to season the food because the food back then was not very tasty. Also, it helped to preserve the food mm -hmm. because winter was coming. Okay, so, so they saw the um, preparing or, or manufacture, I guess is not really the accurate word, but they were gonna sell salt. They were probably gonna provide it for those people at okay. Manchester Station because they probably shared everything. Right. But that would be a way that they made a living. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now he's got his crop of corn uh, there in the field. He's got his cattle there, which is perfect because Neely's Bend is bordered on three sides by water. Ah. He has picked the perfect spot to, uh -huh. to raise his family. And if he has ten children, then he has a crew. He has a, he has his own working crew. He does, but he also has men from the fort that are willing to come and help. They all help each other uh -huh. back and forth. So uh, this is on August 1st, uh, 1780. William Neely and his daughter Mary are there on Neely's Bend by the river, boiling salt, and this is when the attack occurs. Uh, they have just been left behind by uh, Mary's brother Samuel, who we need to speak about later because Samuel's the one who built the cabin that we're gonna be okay. talking about. Okay. And then also a young man by the name of George Spears. George is either uh, Mary's betrothed or they're talking about it so <laughs> so they, they they don't want to leave Mary and William behind but William says we haven't seen Indians in a while just going back we'll see in the morning well they're no longer gone then the Indians come up the bank from the river from their canoes and attack William and Mary William is too far from his gun to do anything Mary sees her father tomahawked and scalped mm. she faints the next thing she knows, she is being drugged to a canoe with her hands bound. They put her in the canoe and they start down the Cumlin River and eventually they're going to they're gonna meet uh, where the Red River comes into the Cumberland mm -hmm. and there within the, 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 you know, the hillside of Clarksville, which is not a town yet, far mm -hmm. from it, but right there at the spot where the Cumlin River and the Cumlin uh, come to, the Red Cumberland and the Cumberland, and the Red. Yeah, right. come together, uh, a horrible thing happens. Uh, Mary is now part of a group of kidnapped women and children that are headed north. Now, the reason that Mary was taken and the reason all these other captives were taken is because even though the Revolutionary War is coming to the end, the British are paying bounties for scalps and for, for captives. Oh. So the Indians are allying themselves. The Creek with the Shawnee and others are taking these captives because the British want to keep the settlers so upset that they're not willing to come into this new territory, which of course benefited the Indians. And when we say Indians, I'm using the term that Mary used, not today we would say uh, Native Americans. But uh, she became part of a larger group of people being uh, taken north. And at the junction of those two rivers, a baby started crying. And the Indians not wanted to be detected by whatever people were along the banks of you know, present-day mm -hmm, Clarksville mm -hmm. 
bludgeoned the baby to death and threw it in the river. And then when the mother screamed out, they, they knocked her unconscious. So Mary mm -hmm. knew from that point on that there was gonna be a lot of cruelty involved. Mm -hmm. She knew what was, what was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So they are headed north uh, and they, they get from the river and they travel through Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio. All in this canoe with all, all well, the they, captives. They left, they, they've left the uh, canoes behind because they're on land now. Okay, but it's still a group of captives. Yes. Kind of the reverse of Trail of Tears. Yes, yes. And they're hauling these women and children and whatever with them north. Now, as they're traveling early on, Mary is given a choice by the Indians. She is told, you can either become a wife of one of our braves or you can become the slave to the medicine woman. Well, without hesitation, Mary chooses to be the slave, and the brave that she has insulted has never will not forget this. So he's going to make her, her life miserable. Now understand what she's wearing. She's wearing summertime, very light material that she's going to wear nonstop for the next three years of her captivity. Mm. So she is now, you know, she knows the brutality. At one point she leaves her bowl. Uh, and they have traveled forward and they refuse to feed her because she's left her bowl. So she's got to march back by herself two to three hours to get her bowl before they will feed her. It's just... Let me ask you this. Um, this sounds like this is very well documented history. I mean, you know this story. How, how is it that you learned this? I mean, I know that you are an author and that you research where did you find this information out? There's a lot of information on the, on the internet, but a descendant by the name of Patricia Terrell wrote a book chronicling the life of uh, Mary Neely. And you can, you can, of course, buy this book uh, off of Amazon, wherever. But uh, I will say that some of the facts in here are a little bit different from what Mary dictated to her grandson years later. Mary says that her father was tomahawked. Patricia says that he was shot. I tend to agree with the person who saw it and with the, the fact that if you shot the person, you would uh, have alerted the people who just left mm -hmm. and they would have come mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. So there's some discrepancies in the, in the book and what Mary said, but Mary did tell people in years later. So what it was a first-hand account. So that's why first this hand. sounds, you know, when we talk about the bowl and I mean, you really, that was from the horse's mouth. Right. So to speak. Right. Okay. So Mary is uh, traveling along. Uh, and so how does that, how do we get to the cabin? Okay, uh, eventually she is going to escape and her escape is nothing more than miraculous. She gets away from the Indians, away from the British because the British are taking her and the captives that they have now acquired uh, by boat or by ship somewhere. They don't know, they're suspecting back to England maybe and the, the, the ship founders. And Gosh. while it's, it's wrecked on the rocks, the women are getting off, and one of the men who's sympathetic to Mary says, run, and keep going south until you reach such and such. So she is told, you need to avoid this river because it goes into the Great Falls, Niagara Falls. She's <laughs> up in Canada, okay? That's how far north she is. And by the way, she was taken to Fort Detroit to be exchanged for the bounty and so forth. So Mary is now free. And How she's, old is Mary? She's, uh, she was 19 when she was captured. She's probably 22 at this point. Okay. And remember that she, all, through, all these three years that she's been captive, she's wearing summertime garb and she has no coat, mm. very few, she, she makes uh, shoes. Uh, she figures the only reason that the Indians kept her alive is because she could sew so well. And hmm. that, but many times she would ask them to kill her. She was in such misery from pain and uh, mm -hmm. she caught smallpox. You heard stories about the British giving out blankets to the Indians that had smallpox. They did, she caught it, she survived. Hmm. So she has, while she's traveling, she's learning all these things from the medicine woman. She's learning to use natural herbs and right. cures and so forth, which is gonna be very important later on. So she escapes and she makes it back so does she make it back to Neely's Bend? She does, but uh, the story of get her getting there is a little bit interrupted because of a good event. She uh, is on the wilderness road by herself. She runs into somebody that knows her, that's been looking for her. Now her brother Samuel never gave up hope of finding her. He's looking for her. He's asking about a, a girl that is left-handed and uh, different characteristics of her. And 
this Jim Hawkins finds her on the Wilderness Trail, and he says, I have heard of a man named Spears that you might know. Ah. So he takes her to Virginia to a house, and there is the house where her betrothed is living. He's gone back to Virginia because his father lives in Virginia. He was at Neely's Bend last time he saw her. He's now back with his father in Virginia. That, this sounds like it should be a movie. <laughs> it should be a I movie. I mean, that he, she is able to find him. In all of this territory. So they reunite, and uh, Mary's sister has already married the Spears' older brother. So they, now they're sort of related that way. Uh, George Spears did look for Mary, but he has now become, since then, betrothed to another woman. Mm -hmm. He breaks it off with her. He wants Mary. So she is staying there for months when Samuel, her brother, finds out about this girl that's left-handed living with the Spears, and he puts two and two together. She's coming home from church, and he's standing on the front porch with old man Spears, and he says, that's my sister. And the reunion was absolute joy. Absolute joy. And very uh, improbable. Improbable. It's sort of like a Forrest Gump movie. Sort yeah. Of, you know. yeah. <laughs> but, but they eventually, uh, George and, and she get married about a year later. I'm not sure why the delay, if it took some time for him to break off from this other girl. Right. Or she was so ill, she had to get her strength back up. Right. But Well, so did how did they, they must have come back to Neely's Bend. Well, uh, actually they came back to visit, but they decided to settle in Kentucky. Now in Kentucky, they met a person by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln moves north to Illinois. They moved north to Illinois. He's the postmaster of the little community that they live in. Abraham Lincoln and Mary become very, very close friends. He sees her as sort of a surrogate mother. Okay, but going back to Neely's Bend, Mary, once she's reunited with her brother Samuel, gets to hear another massacre, which is going to make her an orphan. Uh, her mother, living back at Mansker Station, a widow with nine children, because Mary's not there uh, at that point, uh, has a, a crop of flax over Neely's Bend. Now, flax is the material of choice for clothing. One acre of flax will clothe one person, and she's insisting she wants to go see her crop of flax, and the men of the fort telling her, this is not a good idea. Uh, you don't really need to go. There's Indian, no. She said, if you won't go, I'll just take a bunch of my women friends, and we'll go. They said, no. So Samuel goes with his mother, and with several men, climb on a horse, they're armed, and they go to these men to look at her flax. Guess who's waiting for them? The Indians. The Indians. <laughs> Samuel's gun lock jams. He can't fire. His mother's so terrified that she won't hand her rifle over to him to fire. She's just totally terrified. Another guy receives seven shots. He's wounded seven times. He falls back. Another man, horse, rears up and he's traveling the opposite direction. So the mother, being the mother that she was to protect her family, her son, she rides her horse right into the Indians and they get her. Hmm. And so Mary has lost her both parents yes. to yes. the Indians. So, okay, now we are back in the Neely's Bend area. Right. So who builds the cabin and why? Okay, Samuel is now given the, the uh, land, a lot of the land in the area. He feels it is now safe to build the cabin. Okay. So he takes the tools that he inherited from his father okay. because you can tell these are not just rough, uh, you know, put together. This is a very organized cabin. They are straight board. Uh, this is virgin cedar, which is a very good uh, uh, wood to use. And he puts chinking in. A chinking, he used chart and horsehair and mud to fill in the spaces between the logs. And he built this, this cabin. The cabin as it was originally designed was a room on one side, dog trot, and a room on the other. Okay. Now, the location of the cabin is probably a little bit north of where the lick was. Uh, he built the cabin, and we think he built what was called the Indian escape room afterwards. Okay, now before you tell us about the Indian escape route, we're gonna take a little break right here. Stay with us and hear about this Indian escape route. Will you become a guardian angel? 
The Humane Society has been saving lives and helping families since 1968. We are an independently operated nonprofit organization, and the strength of our programs rely solely on donations and grants. Your donation will allow us to save animals from the local county shelter, as well as provide low-cost spay, neuter vouchers, and more. All of our programs are geared toward providing families with options that prevent them from surrendering personal or found pets, which might otherwise be euthanized at a shelter. Please be a guardian angel today. Manor Cafe was founded because one man felt called by God to feed the poor. Hello, my name is Kenny York. I'm founder and director of Manor Cafe Ministries. Hunger is a reality here in Montgomery County. Numbers say that one in six adults suffer from food instability. That means they don't know where the next meal is coming from, or they may go to bed hungry. And one in four children, that means children in our own backyards are going to bed hungry. Those numbers aren't going away. In fact, they continue to get worse and worse. One of the ways Mana Cafe combats these issues is through a food pantry, where food boxes containing 30 to 50 pounds of food are distributed to single moms, seniors, military and other families, and anyone else in need. And with a team of dedicated volunteers, Mana Cafe has provided food to thousands of people in the Clarksville, Montgomery County area. Because Mana Cafe is also committed to going where the need exists, the mobile cafe program consists of taking hot, appetizing meals to various outdoor locations throughout the community multiple times per week. Guests receive not only a meal, but also a sense of community and Christian fellowship. Through the mobile pantry program, Mana Cafe periodically distributes thousands of pounds of groceries at various locations throughout the city. Every day, Mana Cafe sends out trucks to pick up food donated by local businesses and food drives and through partnerships with national organizations such as Second Harvest Food Bank, Feed the Children, and Feeding America First. Mana Cafe also offers services to Clarksville families such as a free medical clinic and counseling with an on-site chaplain. Here at Manor, it's not just about the food. It's about restoring dignity. It's about loving our folks. It's about telling them that they matter while we're trying to minister to their basic needs, which is hunger. Now we are standing behind the actual cabin here at 1601 Madison Street. Carolyn is going to tell us a little very specific piece about this cabin and it's about the Indian escape route. So tell us what that would have, what, what is that and what would it have looked like? Okay. What you're looking at, the back of the cabin, if you'll look at the, the log part above, that was the actual part that was there. What you're seeing from the uh, cabin below ground did not exist, except for a small area right in here. The cabin sat on the ground in Neely's Bend, but in this area right here, there was built an Indian escape room. And the purpose of it was in case the Indians uh, came while they were in the, uh, the family was nearby the cabin, they could run to a hole that they had covered up with brush, throw the brush aside, slide down a tunnel into the bottom of the cabin where they could bolt the door shut and be safe. Now, okay, you so they're going into it. It's into not, it. Because I was thinking you were saying Indian escape route. It's but a it's room. it's Indian escape room. Right. Kind of like we have a safe room. Exactly. That, okay. Okay. Exactly. Okay. That's a very good comparison. And it was only about five feet tall, but again, it wasn't meant to be a room as you would stay in. Mm -hmm. But you could not access the room up into the cabin or vice versa. So if the Indians came and burned the cabin down, they still couldn't get to the people hiding there. Okay, so that, that makes sense. And, and we don't, 
see it when we no, look at this, no. but you know that it was there. Know that it was there. Okay, so kind of back to our story. Uh, Sam uh, has found Mary, mm -hmm. and we know that there was another massacre. Mary's now lost her mother also. Mm -hmm. So where are we now in time in relationship to him building this cabin at Neely's Bend? Okay, about 1782, we think he built the cabin because at that time, the Indians were settling down. There are some treaties that have been signed, and so the cabin was built. And again, it very well built uh, and stood the test of time. I mean, it's 232 years later, so it's been around for right. a long time. But uh, Samuel continued to live on Neely's Bend, raise his family, his crops, everything went very well. Uh, Mary, who's been living up north for 30 years, decides at age 82 to take a buckboard with her, some of her uh, family with her, down all the way, drives the wagon herself all the way down from Illinois to Neely's Bend to visit her brother. She pulls up to the cabin and says, hey there, can we stay inside? He comes out and says, oh, is that old Miss Mary Spears out there? <laughs> so they haven't seen She's each other. She's a tough cookie. 30 years, they have a big reunion and Mary finally gets to come home and stays then in the cabin for in about a month. Bend. Yes. Okay. And then she goes back home to die. So if he raised his family in Neely's Bend in Nashville, there must be a lot of descendants that are still in the Nashville There's area. a lot of Neely's and we have one here in Clarksville. Mrs. Lewis Pace is a descendant as I understand. There's some others living here. Uh, the Neely family, of course, William had 10 children and Mary had eight. So there's a lot of, a lot, lot. right. And I know that you're going to, we're, we're going to do a whole show on how this cabin actually went from Neely's Bend in Nashville <laughs> and wound up right here in Clarksville. And kind of on a side note, you've told me that there are a lot of cabins in Clarksville. Tell us just a little bit about and I know you research everything, so you know, but how many cabins do you think there are in Clarksville? There are a lot. I keep hearing people telling me that, oh, there's one here and there's one here. I know for a fact Mrs. Green's boarding house on 7th Street, you can still see the cabin, part of the house that is there, and it's for sale now. Uh, the Howell Cooper house, which is vacant right now, but uh, just recently bought. There's a cabin supposedly in that because that, that house has been here since Clarksville began. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's also, uh, there was a, a house on Greenwood Avenue that was a Hart Caldwell house. Miss, Miss Hall saved that cabin too, and it's part of her new Holland Hills down in Jolton. So log cabins from Clarksville are now in Jolton. And Hyla, Phyla Hall has done a lot of, I mean, she saved a yes. lot of cabins, and I don't think she's ever been really given the credit she needs for what to be. she yes. did. Because if it hadn't been for her, places like this, one wouldn't be in Clarksville. This would have been demolished. Right, right. Demolished. So we have a lot, a lot of history that Carolyn uncovers frequently. But I think one of the really interesting aspects of this is that we as Clarksvillians drive by some of these places so many times and just don't know the story. So you, you do have, I mean, you've done a lot of research, you write books, you have all kinds of this documented mm -hmm. uh, for us as Clarksvillians. Um, and you know, the name of our show is History and Heritage and right. nobody does it better than you. Oh, well. I, um, so this particular one, when was it moved? What, what year? 1968. They were about to put in a road, I'm suspecting it was probably the old Hickory Boulevard that crossed the Cumberland River. Mm -hmm. And they were going to burn this to the ground. Oh, what a loss that would have been. Right. Well, we are going to talk about how it was moved and how Phyla did that in our next show. So Carolyn, thank you. This is our history and our heritage. Hi, this is The Restore. My name is Katherine Norbeck Daly and I'm the manager here at the Habitat for Humanity Restore. Everything we sell in here is donated. All of the proceeds go to benefit the Habitat for Humanity homes. We take windows, doors, building supplies, cabinets, 
household goods, and we will pick up. The ReStore is located in downtown Clarksville at 408 Madison Street, across from Madison Street United Methodist Church. The phone number is 645-4242. Call us to schedule your next donation pickup.